Thank you. What a, what a Jesus we serve. What a Jesus we have. So honored to have you tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing your Bible. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 11. <clears throat> We're looking again tonight at verse 21 down through verse 24. And uh, I thought maybe this would be a little unusual, but uh, probably not. Um, but uh, this week, as I got into this passage and have been saturating with you uh, for a couple of weeks, well, several weeks, many weeks, on this particular passage, uh, something hit me like a ton of bricks, and uh, I'm going to try to share that with you a little tonight, and <clears throat> uh, which seems to be really, uh, I don't know why I didn't see the undercurrent. I guess I did see it a little bit. You know how you see something on the surface, and then it really comes through loud and clear uh, in, a, in a greater way, and that's kind of what's happening to me in this passage. Uh, so we're going to uh, go over some of the material and some of the things we've already walked through, but want to get uh, to the heart of this passage. want to read as we begin at Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. Then Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because... They did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Let's pray. It scares me, Jesus. Just the very thought that you would stand before me and give me woe. That you would think this about me. That I could fit into this category. That my life could become so wrapped up in itself. And my own thing and so busy and all involved and my needs and even in a ministerial way that I could get so wrapped up in church work and preaching and ministering and doing stuff and running around and getting this done and operating that and having this program that in the midst of it, in the midst of all the religious activity of my life, I would miss you and would have been better off if I'd have been a pagan in the city of Tyre and Sidon. I'd have been better off to have been a homosexual in Sodom than to be the minister of the church and not have been focused on you. I just don't know what to do with that. That just cuts me to the bone, Jesus, and it drives me to the wall tonight to say, I don't want to miss you in any aspect, I don't want any other focus. I don't want one single split moment of my life to be distracted. I don't want fame. I don't want a compliment. I don't want, I don't want anything to, in any degree, to get in the way between you and me. I don't want my body drives. I, I don't want my own desires. I, I don't want how I think I should be treated. I don't want my rights. I, 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 don't want, I don't want anything to stand in the way between you and me. I want a clear channel at all times. So I don't know what you need to do in me to get that done tonight, but here I am. Here I am. Here I am. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, <clears throat> one of the things we've been emphasizing in this passage is the idea of a contrast. And uh, I think that that is true. I guess what stimulated that was in verse 22, the word but. Uh, you've got the conjunction but given to you there. And down in verse 24, you have it again, the conjunction but. 
And of that immediately gives you the idea of a contrast. And the whole passage lend, lends that. Uh, over here you've got three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. Oh, they're the religious cities. They're the cities of Palestine. They've had the miracles of Jesus done up and down their streets. They've had the presence of God walking among them. That's all over here. They've certainly experienced all of that. Over here you've got three other cities. They're the Tyre and Sidon and the Sodom city. And they're the ancient cities of old. They're pagan cities. They didn't know anything about the gospel. They certainly didn't know anything about uh, Jehovah and and uh, Messiah coming and all of that sort of thing. They were just over here. So you got three pagan cities. You got three religious cities. You got three cities that are filthy to the core. Paganism, Sodom with all of its sodomy and all of its homosexuality and all the stuff you can read about that they were involved in. All compared to over here, the religious city of Capernaum where Jesus made his world headquarters and uh, did most of his mighty works and the and all of these cities, three cities here and three cities. See, you've got a phenomenal contrast there. And the contrast, of course, is, oh, if what had been done here had been done here, they would have repented. You didn't repent, so you are all, you're in a bad spot, son. You're in a real bad spot. Because you've had heavy responsibility with the truth that's been given to you. And that's a phenomenal contrast, folks. But as I got into this, I discovered that the, uh, the conjunction but in verse 22 and 24 is not the normal word for a contrast, which I felt like going back and rewriting the Bible, you know, but uh, you can't do that. So uh, it is a contrast. So what I just said isn't wrong. It isn't, it's there, but that's not the whole thrust of what really is going on in the passage. The passage is much more than that. And the Greek word that's used there is plan, and uh, it literally is the idea of in addition to or moreover or let me give you this added idea. And when you get into verse 21, you'll note there's the word for. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For. And for, the Greek word there, literally is the idea of uh, the reason for this or because, and it also indicates a contrast. But again, the contrast isn't the big deal. It's the idea of here's the reason for the woe. So he's saying, woe, Chorazin, woe, Bethsaida, and here's why I'm doing that. The reason I'm doing that is the mighty, if the mighty works were done in, uh, were done in you, had been done, that were done in you, had been done in Tyre and Sida, they would have repented. Then he gives, let me even state it more. Let me even go another step in all of that. And the further step is, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sida in the day of judgment than for you. Now, you see the same identical thing going on in verse 23. Capernaum, which was a city that was close to the very heart of Jesus. I mean, he made his hometown there. This was his place, you know. So he moved from Nazareth to this Capernaum place. And he says, you are exalted to heaven. You will be brought down to Hades. Why, why would you say that, Jesus? For it's for this reason, because I'm saying that because of this. If the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would remain until this day. So there is a contrast, but the whole emphasis is beyond a contrast. It's this additional idea, this additional truth that I really want to give to you. Now, as you get into the heart of the passage, the whole idea, and I'm going to say this probably several times until I hope you get tired of hearing it, then I'll know you really got it. So the idea is that the mighty works is the, is the contrast between the old covenant and the new covenant. He's saying to Capernaum, he's saying to Bethsaida, Chorazin, if they, you have experienced the new covenant, Tyre and Sida, they lived in the Old Testament, Old Covenant. If you don't know New Covenant, Old Covenant, New, T Old, New Testament, Old Testament, we're talking basically about the law over against Jesus, basically what you're talking about. So all your life, Tyre and Sida and Sodom, you, Sidon and Sodom, you, you lived in this, you lived under this law thing. That's all you ever knew was the law. 
if this, the very new covenant, the springing of the new release, the wonder of what God was really after all the time, the Jesus who's the first man to walk in the new kingdom, the Jesus who's the king of this new kingdom, the Jesus who's literally instituting this whole thing, who's filled with the Spirit and is sourced by God, the Jesus who's everything God has dreamed that you should be. If, if, if you guys had seen this, oh, they would have repented. You've seen it, and you didn't. So for this reason, this additional truth, but underneath it all is this contrast still, so it's a combination of all of this, which is phenomenal. Now, verse 20 is the basis of his statement, and we, we gave a whole study on just verse 20, but I've got to remind you of the essence of it because it's the context and gives you such a solid foundation for his statement in verse 21, 22, and 23. Besides that, you don't even remember what we said. So in verse 20, you guys are awful tight tonight. <laughs> Loosen up. It's okay. So in verse 20, I know this is really a solemn subject. I understand that. So we don't want to make light of it. But in verse 20, which is the basis for uh, what he's going to say, his woes that are given in 21, 22, and 23, and 24, you notice that it says, uh, had been done, uh, is the word. Had been done. That's a translation. I thought probably it was poieo, and if you haven't been around here, that may, doesn't mean anything to you, but poieo is a word that keeps showing up all the time in the Scriptures. It's a Greek word, and it is translated do, did, or done, and it has the idea of creative flow. So when you're talking about a person who is... Uh, who is sourced by God, and God is working through him, you use the word poieo. When you talk about a tree bearing fruit, you use the word poieo. It's so trees don't do fruit. They produce. They, it flows. It's, it's a nature thing. So the whole idea, I looked at this and thought for sure that this would be the poieo word. The mighty works of Jesus had been done, which would be, oh, the creative spirit of God is working through Jesus, producing these works. Wow, these miracles, all this stuff. That would be what he was saying, but he's not. It's the word genomai, which means the emphasis is not on the creative flow of the spirit that's moving through Jesus, although that's there, but it means that the whole idea is something has started that wasn't. So again, you come back to that emphasis that in the person of Jesus, something has started that has never been before. It is brand new. It came into being. It has to do with origin. So something brand new that you've never seen before has literally come into your city in the person of Jesus. And that should have been so startling to you. That should have been so, whoa, can you believe this? That should have been so, wow, it should have gotten your attention so sufficiently and you should have listened so closely that you would have been drawn into this and experienced it yourself. But you didn't. You didn't. That's the emphasis. Now, let's go back to verse 20 again. Not only this had been done, but the term mighty works. And the mighty works, I really want you to get this, because it's the Greek word dunamis. Now, when we say mighty works, and I've read this passage a thousand times, as you have, and you would think in terms of miracles. In other words, and we're really into miracles. We like miracles. I like miracles. Do you like miracles? I really love miracles, especially when I get to do them. Oh, man, I feel so big. I feel so great. I just feel, hey, applaud. I did a miracle. You know, it, it, it's just giving me a lot of good self-esteem. But in this passage, the mighty works is not just miracles. See, I thought what he was saying here was uh, Capernaum and Bethsaida and Chorazin you had these miracles done. Jesus walked up and down your streets and did these phenomenal miracles. I mean, he, 
He healed people. He blinded eyes were made to see. He raised the dead on your streets. He 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 made crippled people walk. He he uh, uh, the woman with the issue of blood. All of that stuff that Jesus did was so he spoke in a centurion sermon. Was healed clear across town. I mean, he did all those mighty mighty miracles. If those miracles had been done in the in the pagan cities, oh, they would have repented. You didn't. But see, this isn't just about miracles. Zero in here. Mighty works. The word dunamis is used 119 times in the whole New Testament. Only seven times is it translated miracles. Which tells me, I think this word is a little bigger than just miracle miracles. See, it has to do not with just raising the dead, not just with healing blinded eyes, but it goes way, dunamis is, is a word that captures something much bigger than that. Uh, and we've explained it to you in terms of iskus, which is another Greek word, and dunamis, and the parallel of those two words. Iskus is a focus on the resource itself. Dunamis is a focus on the action of that resource that produces something. And that's a keen distinction. Iskus is the resource. For instance, we look at God and say, whoa, he's big. He is. He's mighty. No question about that. He's strong. Absolutely. He's powerful. No, wouldn't argue with you at all. He's sovereign. You got that one down. He's omnipotent. Amen, amen. Omnipresent. Hallelujah. He's all those things. See, he's got all of this resource and all this power. He's iscus. He's almighty. Yes, he is. What's he doing? He isn't doing anything. He's sitting there. Now he's coming off of that throne and he's beginning to move through the life of Jesus and all of this stuff is happening. Not just walking on water, although that is happening, but not just that kind of stuff. I mean, he's dying on a cross, forgiving people. That's this, mighty works. He doesn't get all wrapped up in the crowd. That's not normal. When you've got 5,000 men besides women and children, which would be at least 20,000 people, and they're all clamoring after you, wanting to make you a king, wouldn't you say, well, if you insist? I mean, wouldn't you? I mean to say, you guys aren't getting it. I'm out of here. That's a miracle, folks. That's a mighty work. That Jesus didn't get trapped in the crowds, didn't get trapped in the fame, didn't get trapped in popularity, didn't get trapped in the politics, didn't get trapped in all of the normal things that go to our head. He didn't get sucked into materialism. He didn't get tra trapped in any of that. And you know that anybody, anybody who could feed a multitude of 20,000 people with a handful of fish and a handful of loaves, and I mean just, pss, 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 whoo, I mean, he could have a chain of restaurants across the countryside and be a millionaire overnight. He would have a financial base for ministry that would knock your socks off. But see, it never entered his mind. Why? Because he wasn't into that. That's a miracle, folks. So what's going on in Jesus is not Iscus. Oh, it is Iscus. But Iscus just sits there. Iscus is God and all that he is, and he's just sitting there. Now he's come off his throne, and he's moving through the life of the man called Jesus, and we're literally seeing the divine life of God in action among us. We're seeing a visible image of the invisible God. Which is more than magic tricks it's the very mannerisms and the whole flow of the dynamic as he walked into town and and you felt it and and, and you knew it and, and and love came and peace came to your home when he walked into your living room and and there was this there was this essence about him and it was flowing life of God and, and and what he's saying Jesus is saying guys something brand new has happened something brand new see all this time you've nailed at altars for 400 years you've known nothing about the presence of God 
God. For 400 years, you've had nothing but laws and nothing but rules and nothing but legalism. For 400 years, you've just done ceremonies and had church. But now something dynamic has happened. God has gotten off his throne and has literally filled the man called Jesus. And there's this flowing life of God that's just going up and down your streets, emanating into your stores. How should you have responded? You should have repented. That's how you should have responded. You should have repented. So when he says mighty works, that's, wow. Now, he comes then to verse 21. That's the basis of his discussion. Then he comes to verse 21 and says, whoa! My wife has said that a lot of times while I'm driving, but... Let's not talk about my driving, please. Who brought that up? Whoa! It's literally the idea of alas! It's the idea not of mad or mean or I'm upset with you or it's not a beating. It's not woe is the idea of I'm in pain over you. It's that what you are and what you've been doing and how you've been acting literally, literally, literally breaks my heart, literally shames me, literally tears me up, literally, I can't stand this, literally, I'm in pain over you. I just, oh. And why am I in pain over you? He says in this verse, see, follow it through, the reason I'm in pain over you is because, here's that word, been done, Something started in your city. Something came to your life that hadn't been before. Something brand new that no one had ever seen before started in your town, came down to your door, knocked, came and ate at your table, man. Came down to your church. Something that had had came into being. Well, what was it that came into being? Oh, the iscus of God. Mighty works. He uses that. See it right there in verse 21. In fact, it's down in verse 23. See, he just hounds that word. And he says this, this iscus, this greatness of who God is, literally came into the flesh of a man and began to flow through that man in your town, walked up and down your streets, and you, you shamed him. What they do? Go out and get drunk? No. Got high on pills? No. Quit coming to church? No. What they do? Didn't do anything. Just, all right, Jesus, I'm going fishing. Just didn't do anything. Something brand new started in your town. The flowing life of God just began. The visible image of the invisible God walked on your streets. The new covenant came. Now he uses the word in verse 21. Do you see it at the end? Long ago. They would have repented long ago. It's a, it's a word that literally nails down a particular period of time or point in time in the past. So he's contrasting. Again, there is a contrast. It's more than that, but there is a contrast. Here's the three cities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, and they've got all of this going on. The life of God has come. God has gotten off his throne, literally walked on their streets. There is a visible image of the invisible God. The new covenant has now presented itself to to them on their streets. And he says, guys, guys, do you realize here's three pagan cities, Tyre and Sidon and Sodom, these three cities. If, If what had happened here today had happened at a period of time in the past in their cities, they would have repented. Now, as I saturated in this, I tried to come to grips with several questions, and I want to present a little of that to you tonight and just see what you think about it. One question is why? Why didn't they repent? 
What was the blockade? In fact, let me ask you, what keeps you from getting in on this? Why don't you leap in with both feet? Why don't you embrace Jesus and just be his and let him flow through your life? And why don't you let him solve your problems? Why don't you let him, why don't you let him take charge of your life? Why, why, what, what could keep you from doing that? Because you see the same thing that happened in those three cities that's happened in your life. God has gotten off his throne and literally in the flowing life of, of, of Jesus has marched right down the middle of the corridor of your living and has, has, has come right up to you nose to nose, face to face, eyeball to eyeball, man. You've seen the very visible image of the invisible God in the person of Jesus. You've even been around church and sat in services where his present just enveloped you. Why wouldn't you embrace all of that? What, what could keep you from it? What could be so glorious and so captivating and so wonderful in your life? I mean, it's really interesting to me. People come and say, oh, I got this problem. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm miserable. Oh, yeah. Talk to a guy on the phone today. Oh, I've been depressed all week. Oh, really? Yeah. Whoa. Well, why wouldn't you just embrace Jesus? Why wouldn't you just? Oh, well, I like this. Do you? See, what, what, why, what, why did they miss it? Now, you could impose a lot of things in the passage. Because my mind just runs wild, and I could make a lot of things up. One thing I could make up would be materialism. Obviously, even if you study the culture of these cities, Capernaum, for instance, was a strong commercial fishing city. So I would, but hey, it's a great day. I would come to church on Sunday, but you know, hey, it's, a, it, it's, it's fishing time. So off they go. See, they miss it. So you could, you could make a strong case in the passage for the idea that one reason they missed it is materialism. They just got wrapped up in their commerce, wrapped up in their stuff, wrapped up in paying their bills, wrapped up in keeping their job, just, ra just all wrapped up in just scraping together a, a living, paying for the fourth TV set. You know, it just it really, they just really, you could make a case for that. be interesting to, uh, if you would just calculate your week, how many hours you just spend in thinking about stuff that revolve, thinking about things that revolve around materialism. What am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? How am I going to, how am I going to get, how am I, my job? Well, and if you say, you, do you want me to not think about money and not think about work? you want me to quit my job? No. Do not quit your job. Again, I don't want to have to work, so you work. Don't quit your job. Don't quit your job. See, it's not a matter of quitting your job. It's a matter of focus. You understand that. It's a matter of whether we're going to See, if you think that if I could just go into full-time ministry where I could just focus on the Bible and loving Jesus and, and, and I could be spiritual like you, you, you haven't got it. You don't know what we're talking about yet. Because if you can't be focused on Jesus in the middle of your job, if you can't be focused in Jesus in the middle of bills that you can't pay, then you, you don't know what we're talking about here. See, that materialism is not a blockade and, and besides, you can't find anything about materialism in this passage. So I don't think that's what he's saying. You know, you could lay a lot of things on this passage. Of course, we could talk about sin. Sin certainly blinded them. But then, if you want to talk about sin, Sodom. Oh. So do you see that he's talking about Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum, these three cities, what kept them from seeking and receiving Jesus? Sin. Well, let's talk about Sodom. He says if Jesus had showed up in Sodom, they would have bought into it. Well, I don't want to describe the sin of Sodom. But whoa. But we know there is a blindness that comes. In fact, Paul wrote this 
great statement in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God should shine on them. And we could talk about that. But again, I don't think that's what the passage is saying. So if the reason is not materialism, the reason is not sin in general, what is the reason why these three cities didn't buy in to the person of Jesus? I believe in saturating in the passage and in its context, the answer comes back to legalism. Legalism? Yeah, legalism. Legalism is a focus on the law. Legalism is a focus on the law. It's an individual who is focused, governed, and focused on regulations, requirements, and duties rather than relationship. Did you get that? A person is not legalistic because he has convictions. A person is legalistic because he has a spirit and a focus in his life. And that spirit and that focus is governed by requirements, performance, doing, duty, rather than relationship. Isn't it interesting that about anybody you want to go to in the church world, you go up to them and say, are you a Christian? I go to church every Sunday. What's he just focused on? Requirements, duty, attendance, what he does. See, he didn't tell you, oh, I love Jesus with my whole heart. That's relational. Are you a Christian? I tied my money. What have you just focused on? You've just focused on requirement, duty, and neither one, going to church on Sunday or tithing, are bad. We understand that. I mean, you ought to do that. That is true. But it's your focus. And we focus not on, oh, I love Jesus with my whole heart. Oh, I know I'm so tight. Oh, we're so tight. Oh, I tell you, Jesus and I are, whoa, we are, I mean, oh, he's, his presence is in my life. I got up this morning with him. I went to bed last night with him. I mean, we just, oh, we live together. This Jesus and I, see, that's relational. Now, I'm trying to say to you that in the context, and I want to, oh, mercy, i got to hurry. I want to try to tell you from the context how these three cities, Chorazin, Capernaum, and Bethsaida, were, the reason they missed this, according to the context of the passage, is they were legalistic. They're Jews, folks. They've had the law, the Old Testament. For 400 years, they've had no presence of God in their cities or in their synagogues or at their temple in Jerusalem. For 400 years, they've done nothing but ceremonies. For 400 years, they've operated according to the laws. For 400 years, they've made the sacrifices. For 400 years, they have had no sense of the reality of God in their lives. For 400 years, along comes Jesus. Oh, the very essence of the life of God flowing in their city streets. You would have thought that it would have, whoa! But they were so steeped in duty requirements, laws, obligations, ceremonies, they didn't make the shift into the embrace of his person. They missed him. See, again, let me state, it isn't that the law is bad. The law is not bad. Jesus said, and we're getting into that on the Sermon on the Mount, he didn't, he didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill the law. But when you fulfill the law, it doesn't go away. It's still there, but it's no longer the focus. When I was in kindergarten, I played with the alphabet 
blocks. A, B. My mother stood me up and said, sing the alphabet song. This is my chance to do a solo, isn't it? <laughs> and I just blew it. Is the alphabet important? Yes. But folks, I don't think about the alphabet anymore. Why? It's been fulfilled in the reading. Does that make sense? So it isn't that there aren't obligations. It isn't that there isn't duty. It isn't that there are laws. But that's been sucked into a relationship. And the relationship is so strong that that, that is not the focus. Did I do it right or did not? No, that's not the focus. This is about embrace. This is about love. This is about intimacy. This is about oneness. That, that's, that's, that's the deal here. Now, look at chapter 11. Go back to verse... Uh, Go back to verse 16. This is context. In verse 16, he says to this group, but to what shall I like in this generation? What are you guys like? He says, I'll tell you what you're like. You're like a bunch of kids sitting in the marketplace calling to your companions. And we've done studies on this, but he says, we play the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourn for you and you did not lament. See, we couldn't please you. Didn't matter what game we wanted to play, you wouldn't play. Because you had your own game. In fact, verse 18, John the Baptist came and he didn't eat or drink and you said, he has a devil. The son of man, he came and he did eat and drink and you said, he's a glutton and a wine beaver. See, nothing we did. If we ate, you didn't like it. If we didn't eat, you didn't like it. Why? Because you've got your own deal going. See, your legalism is so focused and narrow in your own duty and your own responsibility and your own obligation and what you've figured out, and you've got this little pattern right here, and anybody that deviates from that to the right or the left, you don't know. That's awful, isn't it? Isn't that awful? In fact, go from there, then you have our passage. Go to chapter 12. We're talking context here. And in the context, chapter 12. Isn't it interesting what chapter 12 is all about? Verse 1, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath day. <laughs> His disciples were hungry. Disciples are always hungry. You guys are always good night. So disciples are, are hungry. Yeah, well, they're always hungry. It's biblical for disciples to be hungry. Right there it is. And so they begin to pluck heads of grain and eat. Now, this is the Sabbath day. Well, they're stealing the grain. No, they're not. That was, in their culture, that was okay. See, anybody could go and pick grain, rub it between their hands. Picking is, is harvesting. This is thrashing, and then eat it, which would be preparing a meal. So they broke the Sabbath day law three times. They harvested, they thrashed, and they prepared a meal. And you can't do either one of those on the Sabbath day. Who said? Who said that? Who made that rule? God did? No, he didn't. God never said that. Well, who, who, who made that up? They did. Now, look what they did. They're all bent out of shape. Look, verse 2, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. Now, get the impact here. The iscus of God, the resource of God, has just come off the throne, entered into the man called Jesus, and is flowing down their streets. They're literally seeing the visible image of the invisible God walking down their streets. And all they can say is, your disciples just picked green. They harvested. They just, oh! 
would you not agree that they are focused on wouldn't you have to admit that their focus is definitely not on the movement of God I hate to get into illustrations of this I think maybe that was a lie I don't know We have this phenomenal service. God is moving. People are at the altar. Oh, his presence is so thick. You could cut it with a knife. It's just, oh, I mean, oh, I just, and somebody will meet me at the door and say, I nearly froze to death in that service. (laughs) Where on earth did that come from? You just said in the flowing life of God, And you missed it because, oh. Isn't that interesting? I'm sure I've told you my favorite story. Shaking hands at the door, these two older ladies came in. And I listened to their conversation as they came in. I love this story. They came in. This actually happened. And one lady said, she's walking with a cane. She said, Six dollars a pill! Six dollars a pill! I'm telling you, six dollars a pill! I have to take three of them a day, nearly breaking me up! Six dollars a pill? I thought, wow, that's really expensive. So, we came in, had the service. Oh, God moved. I'm telling you, it was just, again, it was just one of those, and there was just the presence and the flowing life of God was taking place. The service is over. I'm standing at the door. Here came the two ladies. Yeah, I said six dollars a pill! Six dollars! That's these three cities. That's these three cities. That's these three cities. The moving life of God is just flowing within their being and flowing through the life of Jesus into their city streets. And they are so, where your disciples just pick grain. Go down to verse 9. See, he, did, he won't get off this. Go down to chapter 12, verse 9. Again, context. And, and he departed from there and went to the synagogue. And behold, there was a man with a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And why did they do that? That they might accuse him. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? No, it's not lawful to heal on the Sabbath. Let the man die. Should we help that guy or shouldn't we? Duh. Why shouldn't we? Well, bless God, you make your bed, you got to lie in it. Aren't you glad you don't have to lie in the bed you made? See this attitude? See, that's a legalistic attitude. Well, I'm not going to help them. Why? Well, they got an earring. The flowing life of God just... And you looked at a, am I going to have an earring? No. Well, maybe. No. (laughs) You know, what? what's the deal? You understand what I'm trying to tell you? You can get so, and they missed the whole, that's what, I believe that's what he's saying in the passage. He's saying Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. You've gotten so wrapped up and so wrapped up in legalism, so wrapped up in, now again, the law is not bad, but we're talking focus here. And you've gotten so focused on obligation and duty and performance that when the flowing life of God showed up, you you missed it. Well, what does that mean? Well, it might be better to raise your kids in paganism than it is in the church. If the church is about requirements, 
duty and obligation. That's awful, isn't it? What did I teach my kids? What did they get out of church? Don't do that. Can't go there. Stop that. Don't. Sit down. Did they learn? Did I teach my kids? Oh, Jesus is wonderful. When they left for school in the morning, did I say, you guys behave yourself at school. If you get a whipping, bless God, I'll whip you too. Did they get that? Or did they say, oh, walk with Jesus today. Practice his presence today. Live in his oneness today. Did, did they get, see, was it, or was it relational? Did they? When you prayed for them, did you say, oh, help them to be good today. Help them to be a good boy today. Or did you say, oh, may the blessings of Jesus, the presence of Jesus saturate them. May they, see, is it, or is it relational and embraced? See, we taught them to be. Could you push aside everything but him and embrace him tonight? Because if you won't, there is no way we can please you. Because if we eat, you don't like it. If we don't eat, you don't like it. If we do this, you don't like it. If we do that, somebody won't like it. See, somebody, the, because you, you're not here and you're not here, you're here. And you've got your own. The only chance we've got, folks, is Jesus. And we're going to end up being Chorazim, Bethsaida, Capernaum, and miss repentance, miss embracing the flowing life of God. It's come to our midst. Jesus. Oh, wow. I have missed it. I, I admit that tonight. I, I repent, God. I repent. I've been, I've been more focused on who performs and who doesn't and who did and who didn't and, and what they did and what they didn't do. And I, I've been more, God, I've been, an, I've been more wrapped up in materialism and how it looks and and how we look and what we wear and what we don't wear and how we did or what we God, I've been more involved in the duty and the requirement and the performance and the ceremony and the program than the intimacy and the oneness of your presence. Forgive me. And you played the flute and I wouldn't dance and you lamented and I wouldn't lament. You ate, and I wouldn't eat with you, and you didn't eat, and I wouldn't join in on that either. It's about the flowing life of God. Has walked right up to you tonight and banged on your forehead. The iscus, which has become the dunamis, which is the flow of his life, has enveloped you, wrapped his arm around you. Would you embrace him tonight? Would you be so wrapped up in whatever you're wrapped up in would you be so sidetracked with whatever you're sidetracked with? Would you be so self-absorbed that you couldn't see Him?
altars open for repentance. Which is giving up a former thought to embrace a new thought. Say, God, I, I, I don't want to miss you, Jesus. I don't want to be so wrapped up in what I do or what I've got to do and how I, whether I did it right. And then I miss the wonder of your presence. And man, I want to tell you tonight, you don't have to be like you are. You, there's a way out of this, man. He's walked down your streets. The dunamis, the flowing life of God, is embracing you. Will you embrace him back? Will you embrace him back? Would you just embrace him back tonight? He wants you. Be obedient. Moments of seeking. Moments of seeking.